The first cycloidal propellers were thought up in the early 20th century, but now the same principles are being repurposed for modern vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. Later we'll be checking out the company Cyclotech, who are doing just that, and see if their idea is getting off the ground. But first, let's see how cycloidal propellers actually work, and why they might be favourable over conventional ones. The first notable design of something resembling a cyclorotor is the Samuljot, by Russian engineer E.P. Sverchkov in 1909. This vehicle, featuring paddle wheels for propulsion, was a step in cyclorotor development, but did not achieve flight. Further advancements were made in the 1930s, notably by Adolf Roback in Germany. The DVL, who are the German Research Institute for Aviation, evaluated Roback's design, but the foreign aviation journals of the time cast doubt on the design, which meant that the funding for the project could not be raised. I also found this ridiculous clip of something resembling a plane by a Jonathan Edward Caldwell. The plan was for the rotating wings to cause the aircraft to fly like a goose. Mr. Caldwell was later charged with fraud and a working aircraft was never completed. I'm sure you're all just as surprised as I am. There was also the Schroeder S1 of 1930, a full-size prototype which used a cyclorotor only for forward thrust and looked a lot like a flying combine harvester. I can't find much information about the Schroeder S1 online, but it represents an era of innovation and interest in the mid 20th century where engineers were trying to find new and interesting ways to increase the performance and maneuverability of aircraft. The first operational application of cyclorotor technology was the Voith Schneider propeller, developed by Ernst Schneider and enhanced by the company Voith. Unlike other systems, this was built for marine propulsion and was successfully tested in 1937. The Voith Schneider propeller, or VSP, is a type of cycloidal propeller that was patented in 1931. This propeller revolutionised the ways ships could manoeuvre, offering unparalleled precision and control compared to traditional propeller systems. The ability of VSP equipped vessels to move laterally, rotate on the spot and provide accurate thrust in any direction made it particularly useful for tugs, ferries and other vessels requiring high maneuverability. The VSP's potential was further recognised during World War II, where the need for nimble, highly maneuverable vessels became apparent. However, its widespread adoption in military applications was somewhat restricted due to the war's demand and need for more mature technologies. In the post-war era, the Voith Schneider propeller found its niche in civil maritime applications. Its adoption was driven by the growing recognition of its advantages in safety, efficiency and operational versatility. Ports, harbours and the flourishing offshore industry saw the VSP as a solution to their increasingly complex operational challenges. Over the decades, Voith continued to refine and innovate on the VSP. Advancements in hydrodynamics, control systems and material science continue to improve its performance and range of applications. Today, it's not only found in marine vessels, but also in dynamic positioning systems for floating cranes and even in renewable energy applications such as tidal and river current turbines. I found a few videos of these in action and they are pretty incredible to watch. Out of the water, they look like some kind of death trap, but on a scale model of a tugboat, you can see how it is able to easily move in any direction without having to rotate the whole vessel. The transition of the cycloidal propeller concept that had been working in maritime applications for decades into aviation is a fascinating example of technological adaptation. Whilst the core principles are grounded in the same theory, successfully using cyclorotors for aircrafts involves significant re-engineering to suit air instead of water. Given the continued success of the Voith Schneider propeller, you can see why the pursuit for airbound cyclorotors continues. Engineers remain understandably excited with the promise of increased maneuverability and efficient thrust vectoring, that being the possibility to change the direction of thrust in any direction. You can see this in action from a test video from the company Cyclotech, where the direction of the outgoing smoke can be precisely controlled. To understand how this precise control is possible, let's take a closer look at how exactly this propeller works, and then see it in an aircraft. But before that, if you want to design propellers of your own, or anything else for that matter, you need to know about today's sponsor, Onshape. Onshape is a professional grade computer aided design software that is completely free for all makers and hobbyists forever. 
It's even free for engineers and companies for six months so they can properly try it out. What blows my mind is that you can set up everything in two minutes without downloading anything and make whatever you want, just like I've done on so many projects. Because Onshape is built with a cloud native architecture, it enables features such as real-time collaboration, seamless integration with mobile and tablet use for iOS and Android, and built-in product data management. Cloud auto-saving also means you won't ever lose all your work halfway through a project. File sharing can also be as simple as just sending a link, just like the ones I've got in the description. Onshape is also continuously adding new features, so go check it out for free and start creating whatever you want using my link onshape.pro slash Xeroth, which is also down in the description. Okay, now for the magic of cycloidal propellers. The exact working principle of different cyclorotors changes from system to system, but let's start with the similarities. As you've probably seen, the rotors have a number of aerofoils arranged in a circular pattern around a disc. These aerofoils therefore generate lift and drag as the cylinders spin around. However, in order to generate lift or thrust in a single uniform direction, these aerofoils need to be at different angles of attack depending on where they are in the circular loop. For example, if we want to go upwards, the leading edge of the aerofoil on the top would need to point away from the centre of rotation whereas the leading edge of the aerofoil on the bottom would need to point towards the center. The aerofoils on the sides would therefore be tucked in as they transition to try and minimize their drag. The direction that these aerofoils point can be used to quickly change the direction of thrust from the propeller. For example, to change the direction downwards, the top aerofoil would have to point into the center and the bottom aerofoil away from the center. This means the high pressure side of the airfoil is now on the upper side, forcing it downwards. Similarly, the angle of the side airfoils could be altered for side to side movement. A lot of cyclorotors will use a mechanical linkage, so they can control the angle of attack of all the airfoils at once. This is a simple way to control everything to make sure it's in unison, and make sure each blade rotates at the right point. This is important because each blade must shift in orientation as it changes from being at the top, sides and bottom. Modern setups like the ABB Dynafin actually use individual servo motors to control each airfoil. Although this is more complex from a control point of view, it allows more flexibility and likely higher efficiencies. Due to the different properties of water and air, the timings and angles of attack in cyclorotors for each application do vary. In fact, some marine systems I've seen kick out one blade with such a high angle of attack, it seems to act as more of a paddle. Nevertheless, this is broadly how they work, which brings me on to some other interesting benefits. Unlike conventional propellers that have tips which move much faster than the inner portions of the propeller, the blades of cyclorotors all move at the same speed. This means the lift they generate is more uniform by default, but it also means they are quieter and don't create vortices and loud noises from the rapidly moving tips. This reduction in noise could be a pretty big benefit if you want to use these in air taxis in urban environments, which I think is the plan for Cyclotech. Before looking at Cyclotech, it's worth noting that these propellers aren't all sunshine and rainbows. Their unique blade movement requires intricate control systems, which can increase the cost and maintenance requirements. Additionally, the varying angle of attacks and dynamic nature of their operation subjects the blades and structures to significant stresses, potentially leading to wear and tear or even failure under harsh conditions. This is made worse by the fact the rotor is essentially trying to pull itself apart the faster it spins. The size of cycloidal propeller systems are also considerably bigger than conventional propellers, in turn increasing their weight. Even if a cyclorotor's thrust vectoring abilities make it more efficient in some scenarios, it might be useless if the thrust to weight ratio is too low. Thankfully, engineers aren't ones to give up quickly when things get complicated and possibly impractical. Flying cars have been a childhood dream of so many of us, and I think part of the excitement around the Cyclotech vehicle is based on the flying car feeling it gives off. This all-electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicle, or eVTOL, might be a while away from taking me from my driveway onto a big utopian city of opportunity. But what they have achieved is still pretty incredible. Cyclotech is an Austrian company 
that has been working on their rotor design for over 15 years now, and just received over $20 million of additional funding. Their main test vehicle appears to be a carbon fiber chassis with four of their cycler rotors attached. The vehicle weighs just 83 kilograms, of which roughly half is the cycler rotors. Each cycler rotor spins up to 3,100 RPM, and they have successfully shown the ability for the vehicle to fly indoors, tethered up. However, after permission from the European Union Aviation Safety Agency in 2023, they've also demonstrated the vehicle flying outdoors. There's no talk of the flight time available here, but I imagine it's very limited, given that adding batteries would quickly send up the weight of the system. I do have to wonder if the cycler rotor design gives any real benefits over conventional propellers in this use case. We've already seen products like the Jetson 1 demonstrate that it is possible to achieve a lot of the aims of Cyclotech using more mature technologies. The Jetson 1 is a similar weight at 86 kilograms, but allows for another 95 kilograms in pilot weight on top of that, with a flight time of 20 minutes. I have to say, I really want to have a go in one of these. Think how easy it would be to trim all of the local hedges or lose an arm. As you're still watching, please subscribe to the channel as I think you'll like some of the other videos I make, like this one on drones that can 3D print houses. Your support helps the channel so much, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on the future of cycler rotors in the comments down below. Thanks for watching.